that's what we're talking about here, Max. We, we, you, we can learn. We can look at situations that we aren't good at, um, and we can learn to handle them differently. We can learn to experience life from a different place. And when we do this, everything calms down, um, and we start to be um, – just more sedate inside, more blissful inside, you know, more content. And we're also much more efficient at everything that we do because um, we're content to be just in the moment. You know, in the moment, there is no future, you know, and there's no past. You're just doing what you're doing right now. And in general, I find that what people do is they pollute this moment by thinking of stuff that they have to get done or stuff that they should have said yesterday. And, you know, if you look at like, if you're working on a report and you got to have this report done, if you're thinking about, I don't know if I'm going to get this done, all that energy is not going into finishing the report. So if you can surrender just from a standpoint of practicality, knowing, look, if I'm just totally immersed in this moment, working on this, I'm working at my highest potential. And that's the best you can do. Welcome back to the Max Out Show, where today I'm joined by Tom Sterner, founder of the Practicing Mind Institute and the best-selling author of The Practicing Mind. Tom is a leading expert in thought awareness training and helping people become more engaged in a pursuit of their goals to achieve greater joy, peace, and success. So Tom, welcome to the show. Hi, Max. Thanks for having me. Super excited to have you. And so I want to get started with this experience that so many people of us are seeking the gold at the end of the rainbow, the moment of, you know, finally achieving that big dream and then oftentimes realizing it's not actually it. So can you share with us what usually happens when we reach our goals and, you know, why it might not be the best idea to always just seek the end in mind? Sure. Um, you know, I think that one of the things that we have to realize is that what makes any goal worth achieving is the process of achieving it. I mean, you know, I can take a piece of chalk and I can draw a line on the sidewalk and I can say, there's the finish line, go ahead and step over it. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. What we, we forget to realize is that what makes the experience of achieving a goal the, um, feel the way that it does is everything that we went through in the process of achieving the goal. So if we can switch our um, priority uh, to being in the process of achieving, and that's where we want to be, then we're experiencing this uh, feeling all the time. And actually the goal, you know, I, I guess we misuse the goal, I guess is a good way of putting it. You know, that we need something to steer our energy. We need a target. An archer needs a target. Otherwise, he's just drawing the bow and shooting the arrow up in the sky. You need a bullseye, but the bullseye should just serve to focus your attention and to focus your energy. And after that, you know, there's a story in the uh, in the practicing mind that talks about in the 1970s, I used to shoot a lot of target archery and uh, there was an Olympic archery coach and the Asians who were raised in a completely different paradigm than in the West because they had uh, so much of a Zen background, which was very present moment oriented and being completely absorbed in the process of something. They were just kicking everybody's tail mm -hmm. and they couldn't, under, you know, the, they couldn't understand why at first, but the American coach realized that the difference between the Asian archers and the American and his team was, and the rest of the Western teams was that the Asians were, their goal was to be immersed in the process of drawing the bow. And because of that, the target, the bullseye just got in the way. The Americans were obsessed with getting bullseyes. And so for them, the only reason they drew the bow was so they could let the arrow go and see if they got a bullseye. And so the mindset was completely different. The, um, the quality of the bow draw for the Asians was way higher and they were enjoying themselves because that's where their mind was. There was only the present moment in drawing the bow. The Americans were attached to the future, the moment the arrow hit the target and that would then feed back to them whether they were successful or not. So now you see across the board in sports psychology that virtually no one functions like that anymore because you're just not competitive. We know through neuroscience and the sports psychology and all this stuff that what they've been saying in the East, it's just a, another side of the same coin, is that when you're functioning at your highest level, you're totally aware of your thoughts, and you're also in the present moment focusing on just one thing. And there's a lot of reasons uh, why you are at your highest performance uh, in, you know, in that state of mind. 
Yeah, for sure. And I really want to dive also deeper into like why exactly this so so people can really understand the, the reasoning behind it. But I'm super curious about what you just said. Um, this this idea where it seems like we almost enjoy a goal more in proportion to how much effort we put in, like in advance. Would you say that is accurate? Yeah, that is accurate. And I mean, you know, you can take like say an Olympic size swimming pool and give somebody a tennis ball and say, I want you to throw the ball in the pool. And it's like, so what? But you put a little bucket in the middle of the pool and you say, I'll give you this much money if you can get that ball in there. All of a sudden, the interest goes up, the focus goes up, everything becomes, because that we love a challenge. And, uh, and what do you, you know, I, when I, I've done clinics with like uh, high school kids and I've said, you know, what do you do with a video game when you master it? They go, I either go to the next level or I get rid of it if it doesn't have one. <laughs> and I said, that's right. And why is that? I said, because you like it to be at your threshold. You want it to be where you can kind of do it sometimes, but not kind of do it. And so that you have this process of uh, this competitive thing where you're going to beat it. And I said, that's what you like. It's for the way that we're, we're designed. And uh, otherwise we'd be living in caves. We would have just said, yeah, this is okay. Okay. Um, you know, we're always, we're built to expand and we're built to look further. And that's, uh, you know, that's what we've done. Unfortunately, you know, with the media having access to us all the time, we are programmed when we have that feeling, we're programmed to feel like we're incomplete because we don't have the goal. So um, because somebody's always trying to sell us something, whether it's a, an object or an experience. And so what we're told is that you're here and you have this feeling inside of you. And this feeling is incompleteness. And in order to get rid of that feeling, you need this thing that's over there. And whenever you, you know, so what does that do? It immediately puts you at war with the, the space between you and where that, that, um, that time space and the effort space, because now you're thinking, well, I can't feel good until I get over there. But in reality, it's what you go through that makes that feel good. And as we just discussed, and the other thing is that, um, you know, when we when we, we look at things like that, then we're always in a state of unrest because we're always where we don't want to be. <clears throat> and that is uh, it's a it's not a very productive way to go through life. And it's not, a, you know, your mind isn't a very good place to spend your day either, you know, when you're in that state. So when you shift, and, and this is a mantra, you know, I think everybody should think of interpretation creates experience. If your interpretation of the process is that it's a nuisance you have to go through to get to your goal, then your experience of the process is going to be very negative. If your interpretation is that this is where the fun is, then, um, and this is what makes that fulfilling, then all of a sudden, you've, it all, it's just, the process is the same. It's just your interpretation of it is what determines how you're going to experience it. Yeah, for sure, 100%. So what do you say then to people that like, they set these goals because they, they come from the outside world, right? They want to they wanna lose some weight or they think they're supposed to lose some weight maybe, right? But they genuinely like just hate exercising. Like how do people learn to actually enjoy the present moment then? Well, the, you know, there's, there's a couple things to understand, and we should talk about thought awareness um, for a second here, because that really plays into that. You know, we are, we are not our thoughts. We uh, experience our thoughts. Now, some thoughts we initiate because we're on the left side of the brain. We're in that 5% of our consciousness. You know, neuroscience says that about 95% of our day is spent in the subconscious realm, meaning that we're just living programs that we have installed. And um, the, the, the 5% of the time, you know, is when we're actually thinking. So what is happening during the day for, for, uh, for all of us is that somebody says something and, um, or a, a something happens in front of us, and then we react to it. We think that we're actually consciously making a choice of how to react to that, but we're not. Now, this is a story I've told, um, which really um, is a great example uh, for how that works. I was talking with a client about this and I said, you know, you're really not consciously making choices or thinking most of the day. I said, it's only a very small percentage. And they disagreed. And they said, uh, and I basically set them up. Um, they, they said, I don't agree with that. I think that I'm there all the time. And so, I said to them, you need to shut up and not talk until I tell you. And as soon as I did that, they went like this. And I said, you see, all I had to do is change my tone. 
just by changing my tone, you were completely driven by your subconscious reaction. Because what happened? Your subconscious went, what do we do when someone talks like this, when we hear this tone? Oh, here's the reaction because this is the way we've reacted a thousand times. And then it plays it out. And then you're just in the reaction and in the behavior. You're no longer a conscious choice maker. So what we need is to get the experience of what does it feel like when I'm in my thoughts and what does it feel like when I'm watching my thoughts? Because when I'm watching my thoughts, that's when I'm in charge. When I'm in my thoughts, I'm not in charge. I'm just a puppet to whatever programming gets played out, which is where most of us spend most of our day. So that's the reason why you really have to get into some sort of a thought awareness training program where you, you, know, you can call it meditation. It doesn't matter to me. They're just labels for a process of learning what it feels like to be the observer of your thought versus being in your thoughts. And once you have that, and this is where I always start with clients is, this is the key to the prison door, because if you don't have that, then you're never objective in any situation. You're just being manipulated by programs that either you have installed over your life or that somebody else has installed. Because you have to understand that the subconscious mind is always awake even when you're asleep, it's awake, it's always watching, it's always listening. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't look at this is going to make them sad, this is going to make them happy. It doesn't look at any of that. Its job is to give you what it thinks you want. So it watches everything you do. So when, I, you know, when people say, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, I'm so bad at this, you know, well, the, the subconscious is listening to that and it gives you that experience. It gives you the behavior. A simple example of that was I was doing a, a clinic for uh, golfers, college golfers one time. And, and one of the kids said to me, um, well, let me give you a scenario. I am on the 18th tee and I'm ahead by one stroke and I have to make a decision. If I play over this pond of water and um, it's, uh, and I get the ball in there, I have a chance for a birdie. But I may go in the water. So my other option is to play out into the fairway more, and I pretty much eliminate my chance for a birdie. And my question to you is, should I take the risk? And so my response to that was, well, first of all, in that scenario, there's other factors. Like, who's one stroke behind you? Are they nine holes behind you and still have nine holes to play? So they have lots of chances. I said, but we're not even going to go there. I said, what we're going to look at is what you just said. Should I take the risk? I said, so let's just look at that shot. I said, how far is it to the green? And he said, like, oh, I don't know, 165 yards. I said, okay, so what club do you hit for that? And he said, uh, a seven iron. I said, okay, if I put you out in the center of the fairway and there's absolutely no trouble between you and the green, can you hit that shot? And he said, yeah, it's a no-brainer. I said, that's right. I said, so what have you done by saying, should I take the risk? There's a feeling that goes on with risk. I said, so your, your subconscious watches your feelings and your thoughts and the images you put in your head. I said, so what you've told your, your subconscious is, go get me the swing that I make when I feel like I'm taking a risk. And I said, and it's going to go get it off the hard drive. And it's going to deliver it to you. And when you stand over the ball, your normal, this is a no-brainer swing, isn't going to be there. The swing you're going to have is the swing that you feel like you're taking a risk. Now, are you operating at your highest level then? No. I said, so you really have to understand that the subconscious is always paying attention. And the reason we, the subconscious, we need it is because if you think about when you're a child, um, you, don't, you learn how to walk one time. You learn how to button your shirt one time. You learn how to feed yourself. You, you know, all those things are just committed to an autoplay. And, um, and we need that. Otherwise, we'd have to figure it out every time. I said, so without that, we would really be in a bad situation. The downside of that is it doesn't get shut off. So it's, it's watching what you're thinking. If you walk into an interview and you're nervous, it's saying, oh, time to get the nervousness out Like, because this is what he does or she does when they go into an interview. So learning, how do you reprogram that? Well, the first thing you have to do is realize that all you're having a thought that's firing off the hard drive. It's going to get in what you've put in there for that particular situation. And even people say, well, what if it's a situation I haven't had before? Well, then the mind goes into a Google search and it just goes, well, um, there, here's 20 20 situations that are not exact, but they're similar. So we'll just extrapolate and this will be the reaction. So you don't really have personal power until you learn to get out of your thoughts and you know what that feels like. And once you have that, now you got the key to the prison door 
and you have the privilege of choice. It doesn't mean the choice is always easy to make because you're trying to undo behavioral programming, but at least you have the opportunity to do it. Before that, you don't. You know, I love this so much. So, so how much is this, all of this, a balance between watching your thoughts and, and steering your thoughts more in an active way? Well, it's, you know, when you when you're watching your thoughts, um, then you have the opportunity to decide, well, when you're watching your thoughts and you're the observer of your thoughts, that means you're going to be in the, the conscious choice making mode. So now you're making decisions that are actually your decisions in this moment. You're in the present moment, you're making those decisions. If you're, and that, that is your, your normal mode of operation when you're watching your thoughts. The other side of that coin is when you're not watching your thoughts, you're just in the, the thought and the emotional content that the thought creates. So every time you have a thought and they say we have like 60,000, the average person has like 60,000 a day. I, don't, I really don't know how they count that, but, yeah, um, must be hard. <laughs> but the, the point is, is that every time you have a thought, that thought, your brain has a chem, has, releases chemicals into your body. They're either, you know, happy, happy chemicals or not happy chemicals, stress, uh, hormones or dopamine or, you know, whatever it is. And um, so if you, you know, you can really tell a lot about what thoughts you're thinking. And I tell people, you need to chase the feeling because the feeling is always, um, is easier to, to notice than the thought because the thoughts are happening like this. The feeling you have, if you're in a situation and you're like, man, I'm, I'm just like feeling anxious or something, then you know, and this is the difference. There's a difference between feeling anxious and noticing you're having an anxious thought. I mean, they're very different perspectives. And when you notice, you're, when you're noticing you're having an anxious thought, now you can have a procedure that you can drop into to deal with that particular situation. And you're completely separate from it because you're like, this, this situation is, is creating, is making me go to the hard drive, get a nervous thought, it's coming out. And I'm noticing that's, that's happening. So this is what I'm gonna do in that situation. It almost becomes, once again, going back to interpretation creates experience. Now you've interpreted that situation differently than just being anxious. And it becomes this, so the anxiety tends to drop away um, to, a, to a very manageable level because now you're not in the anxiety. You're just noticing the anxiety. Now, a good example of that is um, I have a pilot's license, and one of the things that they teach you is what are you going to do if the engine quits? So you don't figure that out when the engine quits. You figure out, you look at the situation, and you go, you know, this is a possible scenario. So what am I going to do? You figured this out when you're not in the scenario is what I'm saying. So you figured this out and you, you go through this in your mind. And we know through neuroscience that the brain, you know, they did this with athletes, uh, I think in the 1980s, they found out that if they had them like sit in a chair and close their eyes, these were Olympic athletes and they were running through their routines, that the same the, from the body and the brain's perspective, it was happening. The brain was the same area the brain was firing off, the same chemicals were being released. So in your mind, if you rehearse this scenario, then when it happens, it just becomes a routine and you're outside of the, the uh, emotional content of the situation. So, and you can take any situation that you want and you can apply this to it, which is one of the things that I work with, you know, with people is to figure out, okay, what are your triggers and what are your situations in your life that do this? Uh, so that, uh, th so that we can, we can, um, we can basically reprogram your response to that. And then eventually that new response just becomes the way that you handle the situation. And you start to see that you're more flatlined, you know, like you feel the joys, but you don't feel the lows because you're, um, you're aware of that. So you allow the, 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 um, the blissful stuff to happen. But when you uh, notice that you're feeling you, when this, this, uh, you know, this nerve center starts to make you feel like something's not right, or I'm, I'm uncomfortable in this situation. The way that I interpret that is I have what I'll call a rescue mantra. And when I'm in that situation, I, I'm like, yeah, man, you're going down. This is when the fun starts. I mean, I look at it as like, I'm waiting for that to happen because when you have this feeling that's uncomfortable, all, all that is, is information. It's just information. And that information is telling you, you're in the midst of doing something that you haven't mastered. 
But stuff that you've mastered doesn't make you uncomfortable. You just do it. It's when you feel uncomfortable and you feel like struggle, which is just a label that has kind of a negative connotation. But what is it really? It's just data. It's just information that's manifesting in a nerve center feeling that's making you realize if you look at it like and you interpret it like that and you go, hmm. You know what? I'm in, I'm in the process of mastering something that I'm not really good at, and I can't master it unless I, I'm in the situation. You know, like, um, I mean, I just had somebody yesterday that was saying that um, they get upset when, um, with themselves when they're going through their meditation or their thought awareness training, and their mind's just, just running all over the place. And I said, yeah, uh, they, he said, because I'm not good at it. And I said, well, first – you can't be bad at it. I said, there is no bad. Sometimes your mind is crazy and sometimes it's not. And I said, really, you want that. I said, because when, if I told you, do you want to be able to calm your mind when it's out of control? I think you would say yes. So how do you get good at controlling your mind when it's out of control? Your mind has to be out of control for you to practice. You yes. can't do it when your mind is calm. I said, so when you're, if you just reinterpret that situation and stop saying, this is bad, I'm not good at this, and say, this is what I've been waiting for. This is what I have been waiting for. This is my opportunity to, to push my threshold further. And I've been, um, it's like I say to golfers when I work with them, if you want to be good at playing in the rain, you get, when it rains, man, that's when you run out of the house. Like um, if, if you want to play good and when it's really windy, you're looking for the wind. And when that wind comes, that's when you're out on the course because you're waiting for that situation that you are here. You want to be here. And how do you get here? Well, you got to be in the situation. So the situation is just data. It's just telling you, I'm here. What do you want to do with me? And so that to me is, again, the interpretation creates the experience. And um, you have so much power in changing your experience simply by changing your interpretation. Because the experience is, it, the, the, the information is just the information. You know, in other words, the uncomfortable feeling is, it's just data, that's all it is. It's nothing more, it's not good, it's not bad, it's just information that's giving you, um, you know, a heads up. You know, if you were good at this, you wouldn't be feeling this way. You, um, because you don't think about stuff that you're really good at. Uh, you only notice things when you're not good at them. You know, I love this process of reframing so much, of taking a quote-unquote negative situation of an uncomfortable feeling, right? The sense of anxiety or fear, whatever, and saying, hey, this is actually practice time, right? This is actually an opportunity for me to grow and evolve and get better. And I really love this aspect of looking in a new light in order to really let go of those feelings or just accept that maybe it's part of the whole process, right? Maybe, you know, the first time you're standing on stage to give a public speak, maybe you're supposed to feel a little bit uncomfortable because that's just part of the game, but you know, you're growing through that. And I love this aspect of, of personal growth that you get from those uncomfortable feelings. And then the, the second thing you said, right, about like really visualizing that in advance to pre-plan how exactly you're going to react so that, you know, the engine is not, you know, dying in the middle of the air and you're unprepared, but you know exactly right. what you're going to do. Well, I ask people that all the time, you know, when they come with a difficult situation, I'll say, um, I'll say, okay, well, let's just pretend I'm going to touch you on the head with a magic wand. And when you're in that situation, you find so uncomfortable, you can be whoever you want to be and you can do whatever you want to do. What is that? And they just look at me. I said, you see, you don't even know. I said, if you don't know, you don't have a, even have a target. You have to have a target because that is really great at pulling you out of that, um, that emotional response and, and pulling you out of the, the programming because you have to be conscious of, of that. So if like, if you say, well, when that happens, what I want to do is this. Well, now when you're outside of your thoughts and you notice you're going into a situation that you know, like you can predict this, this situation always makes me nervous. Okay, like getting up on stage and talking. So if I said, well, what do you want to do when you start to feel that way? You know, what is you, how, are you, how would you like to react to that? If you don't know what that is, then you're just a puppet to the situation. So if you have a plan, then what happens is it's just like in the airplane when the engine quits. When the engine quits, you go, oh, I do A, B, C, D, E. Like, and you're, um, you, know, you look at the guy, um, Captain Sully that landed that Airbus on the Hudson River, you know, a number of years ago, you know, he was a perfect example of that where, you know, everything that could go wrong went wrong. I mean, he had, except it wasn't night, you know, but other than that, he had a full load of fuel, people low over a, a populated, you know, major city and he had just taken off and he lost, I mean, the chances of that happening are just so minuscule. Now, when that happened, if you if you ever have a chance to listen to the transcription of that, like uh, the recording of it, I mean, he's like this. 
And he's like this because he has been through so many simulations of what do you do if this happens? Now, I, I'm sure that he had, that, that panic was, was banging at the door because he's like, you know, I got 200 people that are depending on me to save their lives, not to mention my own. And plus, if I go down in the city, I'm going to wipe out a bunch of people. So, I mean, the pressure was enormous. And yet, he had this routine that he had practiced over and over again that he could drop into. And that's, his mind became very present moment functioning, as I say, the PMF. He's right there. I'm, what I do in this situation is this, 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 this. Now, this thing might be screaming over here, yeah, but we might all die. But he's like, mm, I don't have time for you right now. I have to do this. And that's the, um, that's the beauty uh, of what, what this affords you, the power that it gives you. But you can't get there if you are not aware of your thinking. You cannot get there. You will just be in the, in the, um, the behavior that your subconscious is, has um, learned to behave in that situation. You'll just be a puppet of the situation. And it, that's a really uncomfortable place to be. Yeah, for sure. It's such a powerful reminder to really rehearse in advance how exactly we want to act before we get into the situations. And so the other day, a friend of mine shared this, this formula for me. He said, um, discomfort times resistance is, is, um, is pain, right? Or is, is suffering. I think that's, that's another thing we're, we're getting at here, right? It's like the more you resist, you know, sometimes those feelings, right, which are going to come up, that anxiety or that, you know, pain during a workout, the more you try to resist it, the more suff you're actually going to suffer, right? That's right. And I think that the, um, when you, I, one of the things that makes us, us all feel uncomfortable is when we feel like we're not in control. And, you know, when we are feeling anxious, we feel like we're not in control. We're not in control of the anxiety. We feel like we're not confident in the situation. And, um, and you know, it, does, it doesn't matter what situation you get into. I mean, I don't care how, whether it's life-threatening, whether it's financially threatening. It's not what is your best opportunity to weather the situation. It's when you make clear, you have um, clarity, you have your best decision making. I mean, the fact is that, you know, when you're, um, when you're in your thoughts and dealing with all the emotion, you're not thinking clearly and your decision making goes way down. And so you're not at your best. So it's a very practical, to me, it's a very practical, um, we're talking about, the question is, is a matter of practicality. So in other words, if you look at it from a sports situation and an example I've used, because I think most people can understand it is if you have a guy who's playing basketball and he's on the foul line and he ha he's got two shots and he's got to make one of them, otherwise the team loses. So he shoots the first shot and he misses it. Now there's, there's, he's at a fork in the road. He can berate himself, he can slam the ball down, he can um, be disgusted with himself. He can throw the ball and he, he can shake it. And all that dialogue that is going on in his head, is that going to increase his performance or degrade his performance? It's definitely going to degrade his performance. So I can say to that guy, look, if that would make you get the ball through the hoop on the second time, go for it. But it, it is not. What's going to make you get the ball through the hoop? If your mind is calm, because if your mind isn't calm, your muscles don't work very well. Your commands to your muscles don't work very well. They don't obey you because they're so full of adrenaline. So if you're calm, and then you can do what I call, you know, uh, DOC, D-O-C, do, observe, correct. I said, you look at the first shot. You've made the first shot, and that's the doing. The, observ the observation is watching the ball flight. And then the, the, after that, you have the correction. The ball was left. It was too hard. It hit the backstop and came off, um, or the backboard and came off. All these things, you make the correction so that your next shot is refined. That gives you the absolute highest performance and the best chance of being successful at it. And that's just a matter of practicality. So all this talk about, yeah, but it's uncomfortable. Yeah, I was upset. That doesn't matter. Like, do you want to perform at your highest level? And do you want your experience to be the best it can be, even if it's a difficult situation, like, um, then you have to be in control. And if you are not, if you're in your thoughts, you are not in control. You're just a puppet of whatever your mind is playing out for that particular scenario that it has had installed. And, you know, something else to, re to remember is that when you're in the present moment, your, your thoughts thin out. 
there's not a lot of thinking going on. Like if you watch a golfer who's winning the, a major tournament and they're walking down on the 18th hole, what you notice is their eyes are very still. You know, there's not a lot of, you know, eyes moving, moving, their head moving and everything. They're just, they're, they're in the flow, whatever you want to call it. They're very present moment and there's not a lot of thinking that's going on. It's everything is, it's what I'll call deliberate thinking. Everything is very deliberate. And that's because, when you are in the present moment, you have access to more of your mind because there's not all the static that's going on. So it's, um, and, it, and when you have, and you can look at the mind like, uh, like Ram, you know, like when, when you have all this talking going on, it's like background tasks that are going on. And so you only have access to so much, um, you only have so much ramps, you only have so much access to performance because you've got all this other stuff going on. When you wipe that out, it's like shutting background tasks off. And now all of a sudden you have access to way more consciousness, way more fluidity, uh, may much better decision-making and much more clarity. People say, I can't focus, I don't have clarity. Well, of course you can. You know, your mind is so saturated and so overstimulated because of what's going on in your head all day long that's not surprising it's not because you can't get better at this it's just because you just keep replaying the same behavior over and over again you know it's so interesting and i really want to dive deep into like this this awareness training and like what exactly people can do you know whether it's you know meditation or whatever way to really increase that ability but first there was one thing that i really want to piggyback on which um What's this idea of practicality, of choosing thoughts based on like what they're actually practical or not, right? And so I have this rule in my life that I try to live up to, which is I do think and believe only things that move me towards my goals. And that really reminded me of that, right? That was the essence of that, right? It's like, does this thought serve me? Does this belief serve me? Does this action serve me, right? And I think when it comes to the action, the behavior, people understand, right? If I want to lose weight, I'm not going to eat a bunch of, you know, chocolate chip cookies, Right. right. But I think that the aspects of thinking and believing, those are a lot harder to understand and to really bring into our daily life. Like, does that thought actually help me in, in you know, becoming the person I want to be really, right? Well, yeah, I think that, you know, for me, I'm a very practical and pragmatic person. So what I do um, uh, from, in my own life and, and when I'm working with people is, it's, you know, it's very simple. Identify the problem and fix it. I mean, most people don't identify the problem. They're just in the problem. And so because they're in the problem, they don't even know what they're trying to fix. That's the reason why I said that, the, the, you know, um, when you say to somebody, okay, here's the situation you're, you're struggling with. If you can handle it anyway, what do you want to do? And they don't even know <laughs> because they've never gotten to that point. All they've done is just continue to struggle in the situation because they're just – they're swallowed up by the emotional content of the situation. Here it comes again. I always do this when this happens and, and this sort of thing. And they can't get out of that um, because they don't have the skill. It's just a skill of being out, being the observer of the thoughts, you know, and we're, we're just not taught to do that, you know, uh, in the West, you know, it's becoming more and more prevalent now because we're learning that, well, if you want to be in control, this is, and we can prove it all out through empirical science now. So we're comfortable with it. You know, like I said, it's been around in Eastern thought for thousands of years, but that was like, uh, you know, like uh, I don't want to be wearing a saffron robe up in the Himalayas, you know, but now you're seeing, you know, we've got all these science studies and we have these terms like sports, psychology and neuroscience they're all just saying the same thing but and it's been actually proven because we can put things on people's brains and we can watch what the brain is doing when you're meditating you know what it's doing when you're confused and you know we can look at how the brain is functioning and how the neurons are firing and all this sort of stuff so you know practicality to me because i'm a very practical person is it's if the engine quits it's not very practical to scream all the way to the crash site I mean, it's only practical to say, what can I do in this situation that is going to give me the best chance of survival? Now, we get back to, in that situation, we get back to, yeah, but it's a scary situation. Well, I didn't say it wasn't scary. I, I just said what, what the question is, is what's going to give me the best chance of surviving this situation? The best chance is not going to be absorbed in my panic because then I'm not thinking clearly. So the question is really, okay, well, how do we transmute that? It, how do we get from being in a total panic to being totally analytical instead, like Captain Sully did? You know, well, that's what we're talking about because you have to understand the panic is just a thought. That's all it is. It isn't who you are. You're just reacting to the thought. You are not the thought. You're just experiencing that thought. That thought is being fired off as a reaction to the situation. You can stop that thought. 
with, 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 um, with practice. If you know what the mechanics are, you can do that. And you have to practice it over and over again. And then in that situation, and, and I've seen it over and over again where I've been in situations and people are like, ah, and I'm like, calm down. You know, like um, this, that is not helping us at all in this moment. Like uh, it's just making you go crazy. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, and then, you know, you interfere with other people solving the problem. You know, it's like, uh, so anyway, <laughs> I think right. it, it's really, um, we're really talking about what is practicality? Well, practicality is just, it's in a, in a difficult situation is, um, it's the solution. You know, like if you can look at the situation strictly from a practical standpoint and say, um, what is, what can I do in this situation that is the highest response to this situation? And you, know that you don't have access to that if you're not outside of your, your thinking process. You have to be the one who's initiating it. That's why I say, um, you know, you can say, I use my thoughts. I don't allow my thoughts to use me. I use my mind. I don't allow my mind to use me. I use my emotions. I, well, there's emotions I want to experience. I allow those, those emotions, but I don't allow my emotions to use me. I don't allow these emotions that are going to make me sick you know, or make me angry and treat somebody badly. I don't allow them to use me. And I think what's, what's difficult for the Western mind, you know, being raised in a Western culture is that, uh, well, I had a, a conversation with a guy one time and he, uh, he, had, he was asked me what I did and that sort of thing. And he said, um, I don't agree with your modality. And I said, um, I said, why is that? And he goes, well, he said, because there are th situations that happen and you can't control your emotions. And I said, you make the mistake of thinking that because you can't control your emotions, that no one in the world can control their emotions. I said, in that situation, and I'm here to tell you that you're wrong. You know, I've, you know, I can control my emotions in many, many situations that other people struggle with only because I've practiced, not because I'm some kind of a prodigy, because I've been working at this for decades, like over 40 years. But I've also trained a lot of people in the mechanics of this and worked with them and they can do it. And, and they, you know, they do it, they start to do it within a number of weeks. They start to get outside of their thinking and they start to do this. And for them, you know, they say, you know, this is, this is the, um, this is a game changer. This is a total life changer because I didn't realize how little control I actually had over my actions and my experiences, you know, going through the day. So practicality is basically, you could say it's the prize that, you know, because you, you have the privilege of being practical in a situation that most people would just be driven in and, and they wouldn't have wow. any control over. You know, I never thought about it like this and I absolutely love that. And so I'm really curious, like, do you think there is value? So over the last one and a half years or so, I've really got into, you know, cold showers and ice swimming and, and really seeking out deliberately these these challenges where those emotions will automatically come up, right? And you're just freezing in the cold and stuff. Do you think there's value in like deliberately placing yourself in situations like that in order to have that, as we talked about before, this practice ground really where you're feeling the emotion, right? And then you need to learn to deal with it. Well, that's an interesting question. I think that if for, you know, for some, you know, when people say, um, you know, I tell people we're talking about developing discipline here, you know, I said, but I'm not talking about Navy SEAL discipline where you're going to hold your breath underwater, you know, in 40 degree water for 10 yeah. minutes. Um, but using what you're talking about there, if what you want to do is that, if you want to go and plunge yourself in cold water, um, there is an aspect in that, you know, to me where, uh, and some of it's probably, you know, survival uh, instincts that are just saying, this is not a good idea. Yeah. Um, you know, but I think it, you are talking about having control over the auto responses of the mind because it's going to be uncomfortable and you don't want to put yourself in, in uncomfortable situations. But I think probably of more value to your, to your listeners is that, you know, we don't have to be talking about such an extreme situation here. We can be talking about a person that uh, intimidates you, you know, dealing with a person that intimidates you, dealing with a fear of losing your job. If you're afraid of losing your job, is being afraid of losing your job helping that situation? No, it's just making the situation, not only is it making the situation more taxing on you, it's closing down your ability to think clearly about what should I do in this situation? See, that's not practical. You know, being afraid in a situation is not practical. Now, I, you know, you have to understand that this is, it's so far removed from the way that we feel is normal. Well, I'm just, you know, cause I was raised with, Oh, you can't control your emotions. Your emotions are just your emotions, you know? And, um, but I, you know, what's interestingly about that is that's just the culture I was raised in. 
Not everybody in the world believes that. And so their, their kids were raised differently. So they have a different take on it. And so I've had to unlearn what I was taught, you know, growing up. And it wasn't taught to me intentionally. It was taught to me because that was the truth of the people that were around me, because that was what they had been taught. Uh, but now we're learning, you know, with everything that's out there, there's so much evidence that, you know, I would say to people, like, if you could be in control of your fears, would you want to be? I, I do, you know, like, um, because they don't make me, they don't make me happy. They don't serve my happiness. They don't serve my comfort. And I'm always, um, I, I had someone the other day who's, you know, got a family member who is very depressed and they're concerned about. And, um, and when they get around this person, um, because they're concerned about, say, say um, them taking their life. So they're, when they're around them, they get upset, you know, and I, and I said, you know, you're being pulled into that person's vibration. And um, it's not that that's, it's because you're, you have empathy for the person. I said, so it's not that that's a bad thing, but if I asked you, how are you going to be the most efficient at helping that person in that situation? It's not going to be you being just as emotional as them. And then we're back to the practicality from a practical standpoint. If you want to, you want to give that person as much as you can give them and the best guidance and you have to have clarity, you have to be able to enter that situation and be separate from the emotional pull that you're is natural for you to have. So um, now, if it's a situation where you want to let your emotions flow, it's your choice. But if you don't have that choice, then, um, then you're just a victim of the situation. And you're really, again, when, you, when you're surrounded by people that are all flipping out, they're not helping the situation. There's none, they certainly aren't solving. They're just elevating the energy that's in the situation. So it usually takes someone who's able to, especially in crisis management, you look at EMTs that come up on a car accident or something and there's, you know, hor it's a horrible scene. You can't have them going, oh my gosh, I, I can't even look at this. You know, you can't have that. You have to have people that can look past that and save the life of the people that are in the car. And how do they do that? It's because they're separate from the situation and they're dealing with it from a practical standpoint. You know, we got this situation, this person has this injury, this person has this injury. We got to do this, 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 and this. They're not being pulled into the situation. They're being, they're operating from a very practical standpoint and they've learned to do that. They didn't start out being able to do that. They've been trained and this is how you handle this situation. So they have these go-to procedures and that's, that's what we're talking about here, Max. We, we, you, we can learn. We can look at situations that we aren't good at, um, and we can learn to handle them differently. We can learn to experience life from a different place. And when we do this, everything calms down, um, and we start to be um, – just more sedate inside, more blissful inside, you know, more content. And we're also much more efficient at everything that we do because um, we're content to be just in the moment. You know, in the moment, there is no future, you know, and there's no past. You're just doing what you're doing right now. And in general, I find that what people do is they pollute this moment by thinking of stuff that they have to get done or stuff that they should have said yesterday. And, you know, if you look at like, if you're working on a report and you got to have this report done, if you're thinking about, I don't know if I'm going to get this done, all that energy is not going into finishing the report. So if you can surrender just from a standpoint of practicality, knowing, look, if I'm just totally immersed in this moment, working on this, I'm working at my highest potential. And that's the best you can do. I mean, I had, a, I had a, uh, a doctor that was telling me one time in a session that, um, you know, he wanted to, he had two, two issues. One was he wanted to spend more time with the patients. He said, lots of times, because I have so much paperwork I have to do. He said, and I'm always behind in the paperwork. He said, and many times I want to spend another 10 minutes with a patient. But if, um, and I will, I will do that. He goes, but then I'm just going to pay for it later. And I said, well, I said, what's interesting about that is if you're going to give yourself permission to spend another 10 minutes, then be in the 10 minutes. I said, you're, you're not in the 10 minutes. You're the whole 10 minutes extra. You're thinking about the cost that this is what this is going to cost you time wise. And, the, and I said, so you've, you, you're really not in either one. You're not getting the paperwork done and you're not completely immersed in your conversation with your patient. I said, so you've just polluted the whole situation. I said, so you have to, you know, you, um, make the decision. This is what I'm going to do. And then when you're doing the paperwork, then you're then be totally immersed in the paperwork because, um, 
you know, and he said, like, uh, I asked him, I said, you know, how many patients do you see? And, and he was talking about how this makes you more efficient. And, uh, and I said, yeah, but I said, if you're trying to fit 40 hours worth of paperwork into 20 hours, there is no system that's going to make you be able to do that. I said, you're going to have to understand that maybe you need to take on less patients. I said, I'm not telling you how to run your business. I said, but you have to, once again, you have to be realistic and practical. If um, there, you have a, a limit of what you can accomplish in a day. And that limit is you can b boost it up by more efficiency. You can get more done by being more present moment. I said, and that is going to increase your performance and your productivity. I said, but if it's like saying, I want to lose 30 pounds in five days. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to happen. You're like, um, it doesn't matter how much you exercise and diet. You're not going to do it. It's, it's, it's not possible. So if you set out to do that, then what happens is, is you start analyzing your progress based on this false information that you have, um, this false timeline that you have created for yourself. And then you start doubting your competency and your confidence and your ability to accomplish tasks and goals. And, all, um, and it's all coming from inaccurate data. Yeah, you know, I find it so fascinating that we always judge ourselves based on these, on this, on our progress towards these goals, right? That oftentimes are so arbitrary, so, you know, made up, so artificially created, whether it's timelines or, you know, the size of the goal. And then we judge our, oftentimes our worth, right? Our self-worth and our whole identity. We stake that on, on achieving these goals or how close we are to that rather than just enjoying the process of actually getting there, which then ultimately actually gets us there faster. I find this so fascinating. And well, it's important to know that um, in, on this, you know, I tell people, you know, you have to make your goals with accurate data. And you also have to understand you may not have access to all the data when you start. It may be something you haven't done before. Um, and, you know, you just don't know. You're not going to discover some of the information until partly, but you're part of the way down the path. And you have to be prepared for that. Uh, and, I, you know, I was a victim of that myself. You know, when I wrote The Practicing Mind, I actually wrote it back in the 90s, but I didn't publish it until wow. 2005. Um, and it just based, it just sat as a Word document on my computer. And then oh, wow. uh, I have my service business, which was very successful, and, but I was working seven days a week, and I just really wanted to get the book out there. So it's a story I told and fully engaged. I just, I sold everything. I had business properties. I had a hundred thousand dollars in tooling, huge client base. I just sold everything uh, so that I could get the book published, which <laughs> people thought I was having a midlife crisis. You know? <laughs> I bet. And, you know, I just, I mean, they just thought, Are you absolutely nuts. You have this business that you've locked up the area. You've been doing it for 25 years. You are, you're working through three States and you're always in demand. You've got several years of work booked and you just want to quit all that to write a self help book. And I said, well, I just want to spend the second half of my life working with, you know, with more people. But I had, I did not have accurate data. I assumed that, um, you know, when I sold everything, I was cash rich. And I thought, well, this isn't going to be a problem because I can just pay my bills, you know, like why I get, launch this thing. And I thought, well, let me see, this is, uh, this is 2005. I thought, well, um, there's millions of people on the internet, um, if, not, if not billions. And uh, I'll get a website and I'll put the book out there and geez, if I sell and I'll sell it on Amazon, you know, if I sell it at 0.01%, I'm going to be, I'm you know, going to be fat. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. well, uh, when I started doing that, I was selling two books a week, which <laughs> wow. was about $30. And it cost me, you know, yeah. and of that, I got 15, you know, like um, yeah. <laughs> and it was very clear to me that I was in trouble, you know, mm -hmm. and I certainly didn't want to say anything because I knew I would get like just pummeled with I told you yeah. so's, you know. So, you know, what happened was, is it, it took a while and I, it was just information I didn't have. I didn't have access to, I didn't know what I didn't know. And so uh, eventually what ended up happening was after maybe a year and a half. And I mean, I was, I actually had to go out because I was just hemorrhaging money and I worked, um, I just did part-time work and stuff like that uh, because I needed to support the family and pay my mortgage and all this stuff, you know, while I was doing this. Eventually the book, um, it hit, I think number one in stress management twice on Amazon. And then it just basically took off and then the income just shot up. And then I got 
offered a contract with a major publisher and then everything just changed after that. But my point is, is that I did not have accurate data and I expected things to happen. And so like three months into it, I'm like, why isn't stuff happening? Things haven't <laughs> changed. Well, things actually, in retrospect, things took, they actually came out, pe people couldn't, even the publisher couldn't believe when I signed with them, couldn't believe how much money I was making off the book, just selling it myself on my website and on Amazon as a self publisher. They said, we just don't see this. And my, and my point is, is that like, well, that was what I envisioned. It just took way longer than I thought it did. But if somebody had said to me, and this is a really important point, if somebody had said to me, Tom, you won't really see any income for about 13 or 14 months. If somebody had said that, at three months, I wouldn't, I would have been like, yeah, well, it's only been three months. Yeah. You know? And it's the same thing like with weight loss. If you look at something like weight loss, if somebody says, I want to lose 30 pounds. And they said, it's going to take you three to four months to see a weight loss like that. If you're on this regimen, well, two weeks into it, they wouldn't be getting on the scale and go, I, I can't believe I lost 30 pounds. Everything changes when you have accurate information, your perspective of who you are and where you are in the process. Um, it really gives you a, um, it, it gives you confidence in yourself, and it gives you a, a realistic attitude of what you're supposed to be doing. So I think that that helps to people to accomplish their goals because they're not looking for the accomplishment, the achievement to happen prematurely. Yeah, for sure. So how do you go about now setting these timelines when you're unsure, when you're you don't know, you don't have that accurate data? Do you just like make up a longer timeline just to be able like to? to persevere through, you know, the inevitable obstacles or, or how do you go approach that now? Well, the, all you can do is, well, number one, your mantra is I will not judge. I mean, cause you know, you, you, I will analyze, but I will not judge. You, know, you always have to analyze first to get the information. And then there's an emotional reaction to that information, which is the judgment. So, you know, you will say, okay, I'm going to gather as much data as I can and that's where I'm going to start. It looks to me like I'm going to put a, you know, I'm going to put a point out here. So I have some point of relativity of this much time, but you're, you have the full awareness that I will adjust that as the information comes in. I may have, I may have um, un overestimated. Maybe it's only going to happen in half that time, but in other words, you're completely separate from that because you realize that the emotional reaction is just a thought. That's all. It's just a thought. You know, when you go like, Oh my God, this is taking too long. You know, that's just a thought. And you're just re now you're experiencing that thought, you know, that thought does not make you accomplish the goal faster. And that, we're back to that. All that does is make your experience of accomplishing the goal miserable in yeah. this moment. So if you can learn to just say, this is just data, I'm just getting data. Maybe I need to adjust this. Maybe I need to adjust that. And you just keep, gathering it's always you're just gathering information the information is just the information the information is not it's just telling you that it's that's why you know the word mistake i made a mistake you know that's an interesting term to me because we don't want to make mistakes but what is a mistake it's just information that's all it is this doesn't work <laughs> like yeah. this or this doesn't work as well as i expected it to work you know but i didn't know that because obviously i wouldn't do something that i know wasn't going to work you know like um, if i had known it i wouldn't have done it so you know to me if you can learn that mistakes are fine they're fine. Just redefine, just redefine them. They're just information. It's like, here's, you got, you're going to have to catalog all this information. Like if I had to publish, you know, if I had to publish another book, I wouldn't make all the mistakes I made, you know, um, because I know how to publish a book now. So, you know, to me, it's the same thing. If you, uh, you know, there's one time where I was, as a jazz pianist, I was trying to work out this run and um, I was sitting there practicing it every day, every day, every day. And I don't know, like two weeks went by and I just said, I, I'm not getting any better at this. And I was seeing other people play like this. And I thought, I started to have, to, to doubt my ability to, to play like this, to, to play in the style and the speed. And I thought, you know, maybe I just don't have it. You know, like maybe I don't have the ability to do what I'm watching these other people do that I want to do. And so I quit on it. And this was going back in my early 20s. And about two weeks after that, so it had been four weeks since I started, I, um, I sat down and I was at, I was playing on a job and there wasn't a lot of people there and everything it was kind of a slow night and I was taking a solo and I just thought, yeah, what the heck? And I, and I could play it. And I, I, could, I was like, where'd that come from? Like it was effortless. <laughs> and I didn't, I was too unsophisticated at the time to realize that the brain needs so many days 
to develop the synapses and you know, neurology, everything that has to happen to make, to have the thought make my fingers work that way. And I hadn't given it that time. If somebody had said to me, Tom, this is going to take you four weeks before you can play it. So don't be looking at it in two weeks. I would have been, my experience would have been completely different, but I kept thinking because I didn't have the information. I kept thinking I've been doing this for three days. I should be seeing some results here, you know, but it was every time I was doing that, I was telling my brain, I want you to be able to do this. I want you to be able to do this. I want you to be able to do this. And if I, I could have just relaxed and just did it. And that's why I tell people repeat and relax, just repeat and relax, repeat the behavior you want, analyze, repeat and relax. And when you do that, it's coming. It's coming. Just, you know, just because you don't know how long it should take doesn't mean it's not happening. And so after that, that was such a lesson for me because after that I stopped attaching time frames to stuff. I just said, this is my target. This is my goal. That's my target. Now I'm starting to work towards it. And I will be immersed in the present moment because I know that that's going to get me there as fast as possible. And I stop having this feeling of, I can't be happy until I get there because my happiness is in the process of achieving the goal, not in the moment I have it. And, um, and this is what we do. You know, we feel like, you know, I uh, have been a sailboater for many years and they have a saying that is when you leave the marina, you've reached your destination. And the reason, because for a sailboater, the reason they pick some place to sail, I'll sail down to Joe's Tiki bar today. That's so you have, you have some place to experience sailing you, you what you're really after is the experience of sailing and what is that it's a great metaphor for life you leave the marina you could be going against the tide with the tide you could have um the wind could be blowing from this direction and then it changes and it's coming from that direction then it blows too hard and then it doesn't blow at all and you want to go that way but that's the way the wind's coming so you can't go that way so how do you do that you got to tack what does that mean well i want to go over there but i'm going to have to go over there first and then i'm going to have to go over there and i'm going to zigzag my way it's a great metaphor for achieving goals you know but i'm going to eventually get to joe's tiki bar you know like uh, and i'm getting to experience all these challenges on the way like oh man the wind shifted and we were counting on that all right well what are we going to do with that well let's reset the sales for did it you know it's that whole experience is it's the experience of achieving the goal is where all the joy is and so when you can shift yourself into that then you're not in this place of when am I going to have this? Because you can go back to your life and think about everything you wanted to have. And most of those things you have, and you just move on to the next thing is, you know, after you get it, like, um, it's like, you know, I wanted this, I really wanted this cell phone. I really wanted that car. You know, I really wanted that date, you know, whatever it was, you know, I really wanted to make another $10,000 a year, you know? Yeah. And you just move on to another goal. And that's, um, you know, that's the falsehood, you know, and the fallacy of it all is that we think that if we just have that, that now we're going to be happy when we've missed the point that, the reason we feel incomplete, we that feeling, and once again, that's a label. And when we say the word incomplete, that's, oh, I don't want to be incomplete. Well, no, that's just the universe telling you there's more to you. That's all it's telling you. It's just data. It's, that's more to you. There's more information. You can have more. You can do more. You're limitless, you know? And so if you're limitless, that means you're never going to get to the point where you run out of where you've reached a limit because to me that's what perfection is perfection is the ability to expand infinitely because if it isn't it's just a limit you know it's just another number how fast can i run you know like um how fast can we fly how you know how much money do i need you know like um i mean all those things are just numbers you know like if you say i need a million dollars i need a billion dollars that's just a number like uh so you know Perfection is, uh, as humans, it's our ability to expand infinitely. And that's the reason why we have that feeling. If we didn't have the, the, what the media has made us feel is incomplete, but what it really is is a very natural feeling letting us know we can be better at this. This thing that makes us scared now, we can overcome that and we can, it can become easy for us. Um, that's the reason why you're having this feeling. We can make more money. We can have whatever we want. We can do more things. And that is what, if you look at all the great accomplishments in the, in the world, the Sistine Chapel and, and all the technology, they've all come from people going, I want to do more. I, I want to do more. I want to have more. Otherwise, um, like I said, we would be living in caves because we would be saying, no, nah, this is good enough. Like, uh, I don't need any more. Uh, so when you, if you, again, interpretation creates experience. If you interpret this feeling as just a reminder that you are not, um, you're infinite in what you can become and learn to enjoy that 
that your infinite nature and stop feeling like I'm going to get over there and then this is going to go away. Cause no, it's not going to go away. You're supposed to have it, you know? So um, I think it's a really important point to make. You know, I love this so much. I think if our listeners start applying this, it's going to change so many lives. Now, before I ask my final question, where can listeners connect with you online? Uh, they can connect with me at uh, tomsterner.com. Uh, they can email me at tom at tomsterner.com. And, uh, you know, we have some programs that are going to be coming up, but I also do um, a limited number of one-on-one -on -one coaching. And uh, I love working with people. And so, you know, there's, you can go there and, and sign up for a free half hour with me and we'll just talk about your situation and see if we're a good fit. And I can tell you what I can do for you. Fantastic. So what does it mean for you to max out your life? Well, I think I feel like I've kind of done that, you know, in terms of um, I have impacted people. I, I'm really, it's like hard for me to comprehend sometimes, but I get emails from people from all over the world, letters and stuff. And people have said, you know, you stopped me from being on drugs. You've completely changed my life and dealing with this whole COVID situation. I couldn't function. And this is, com I've not only been able to function, but I've been able to help other people function. And you don't understand the fingers of your work are going all over. I, I don't know what else you could ask for. You know, I mean, um, you only need so much money. Um, you know, like uh, there's, you know, for me, I, I mean, I'm, a, I, I'm pretty simple, you know, in terms of what I want out of life and what I need. And uh, to be able to work with people and then get, feedback like that where you see you've really changed the way people experience their life is uh to me that's that's as good as it gets Sounds because you feel like you have a body of work you know and i and i've been doing this now like i said for 15 years and um and so i've met people i've i've done speaking engagements all over the place and i've met people and you know having so many people you know come up to you and say you know i, I just can't thank you enough it's really I, you know to me that's as that's really as much as you could ask for yeah, absolutely amazing. Hey, Tom, thank you so much. All right, guys, that's it for today. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you gained some valuable ideas, tips, tools, tricks, mindsets, belief systems that will hopefully inspire you to take your life to the next level. At the end of the day, guys, it's all about application. The only thing that's going to set you apart tomorrow from where you are today is how much action you take with those ideas that you gained. And so I really want to challenge you at this point to you know not just – listen to this passively, to not just consume this, you know, passively just thinking about other things, but to really take those lessons, take those ideas that you just gained and start applying them to your life. To so really start taking action and sprinting towards those goals and those dreams that you have in your life. Now guys, at this point, I wanna ask you for a huge favor. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider heading over to iTunes and leaving a review as that helps me really grow the show and reach more people, impact even more people around the world. You know, if you have a family member, a friend, a loved one maybe, that you think could benefit from this content, please consider you know, sharing it with them, forwarding to them, as that helps us really build a community of like-minded people that are all about maxing out their lives. Now guys, with that being said, thanks so much for tuning in today. I really, really appreciate it. Stay strong and see you tomorrow.